I think there's something about trees that makes us want to be close to them. Most cultures have trees in their myths. We all know about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the one in the Garden of Eden. There's nothing wrong with the tree. It's a good tree. It's how you treat it that turns out to be the bad part. Of course, if you know ancient Persian mythology, which I'm sure you all know that there was a tree there too, and Egyptian creation stories tell of the original couple coming out of an acacia tree, and Mesoamerican and North American Indians talk about mythic trees and world trees. Chinese have trees. The Norse have trees are everywhere in mythology. And of course, you get into scriptures. There's Moses, who's set aside by a burning bush. That's a braggart god. He doesn't need a tree. He just needs a bush with a flame in it to get our attention. But it's still a shrub of some kind. And then there's the Buddha, who found enlightenment where? Under a tree. And then there's the Quran. Have you not considered how Allah presents an example, making a good word like a good tree, whose root is firmly fixed and branches high in the sky? Unless you think that's all beyond you, that that's just esoteric mythology, it's fun to read, but we don't do that. Sometime within the next five weeks, you will go and kill a tree and drag it into your house and set it up as an altar and decorate it as though it were made of God's own stuff. And nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to do that. We worship trees. We do a bad job of it, but we worship them, and we should. They are beings that excite our reverence. You know, even in this room, there's a tree. Have you ever seen it? It's up on the walls. All those vines up there. In the Romanesque churches of Italy, from which this church derives its design, a common element is called the arbor vitae, the tree of life, which springs from the foot of the cross and swirls its vines around, encompassing everything in creation. Because, of course, the cross redeems us all to life. Do you see the tree circling around the apostles? That is the tree of life painted right here. And guess what? I'll bet you don't even know it's there. I saw it when I came here years ago. What a wonderful pagan thing to have. I'm delighted. It should not be a surprise, of course, that we reverence trees. They're everywhere, but you know, birds are everywhere. Fish are everywhere. Animals are everywhere. Why do trees seem to stand out in our experience of reverence? Now, that's occasion for another story. In February, a few years ago, when I was in Southern California for a meeting, I took it upon myself to go to Sequoia National Park, which is a, a day's drive and a little bit north of Los Angeles. Now, in February, Los Angeles is like Michigan in May. Delicious. Marvelous. A little cool in the morning, sunny in the afternoon. I got in my car that I rented, put myself up at a hotel, that I had, I had reserved and drove up through the Imperial Valley where there are more raisins than there are people on the planet. You ever seen the sun-made raisin girl on the box? She's about 30 feet tall, just south of Fresno. A really wonderful visage. And I turned east out of Fresno and started climbing up the hills into the Sierras. And it suddenly wasn't 70 degrees. It got to be 60. And by the time it was sunset, it was 40 degrees. And my hotel had snow around the edges. I had packed for Los Angeles. But I had made reservations to go to Sequoia National Park. So the next morning, I put on my sweater, of which I had one, my raincoat, of which I had one. I had a cap. I did have a pair of gloves. I had no boots, but I did have a rented four-wheel drive. And I started to climb up into Sequoia National Park. Now, it's one of those rides that it's 17 miles long and takes 90 minutes. Does that give you a flavor for how narrow the road is? Does that tell you that it was snowing when I was driving? Or that if I veered by a foot and a half, I wouldn't be here now? 
But after that 90 minutes, I found myself at the building where you go in to learn about Sequoia Dendron Giganteum. That's the variety that lives up there. You're going to learn three different, you're going to learn two different Latin names for plants today. Lucky you. It's not the coastal one, that's Sequoia sempervirens. Love those two. But Sequoia Dendron Giganteum is the one that gets so big around you can drive through, you know what I mean? I wanted to see that tree, but I didn't know I was going to have to see it in three feet of snow. But I made the commitment. I got out of my car and I started trudging off to see the General Sherman tree. The General Sherman tree could be the largest single living organism on the planet. How large is it? It's 275 feet tall. How thick is it? If you wrapped a, uh, a tape measure around it, it would come out to be 100 feet at the base. How much tree is there? 2.5 million pounds of redwood. That's a big tree. And it's not the only one. And I stood there in the snow, gobsmacked by its size by its endurance, by the majesty of something so present, so quiet, so real. I was giddy. I was absolutely deranged. I started walking through the snow, going to other trees, touching them. I slipped down a bank, fell within inches of a river, and decided that I'd best go back to my car. Reverence is marked by being deranged when you lose track of reality, because the reality you've beheld is bigger than the reality you have known before, when you're in the presence of a life so vast that you can no longer locate yourself inside it, when you are transported, at least figuratively, into a world much larger than the one you have known, that is reverence. And Semper, excuse me, Sequoia Dendron Giganteum does that to me. We reverence trees because they transport us into a world we know exists, but we forget is out there. And as I stood at the foot of the General Sherman tree, I remembered what I felt like in the crook of that 50-foot pine when I was five. I felt surrounded by life, by a life so large it could hold me and include me in ways I never knew. It reminded me of the mulberry tree that hung over my backyard and dropped its berries into the wading pool I knew when I was seven. It reminded me about the shiny bark of the cherry tree in the house we lived in after that in which I could sit. It reminded me of the live oak outside of my Austin house that shaded my house then and the house that I have now that I chose in part because it has the biggest maple tree on the block. I remembered being in my first parsonage and tapping the maples and tasting the sweet sap that came up from the ground and I felt alive in a way that merely being human does not. And what has all this to do with remembrance? Well, if you know what a tree is made of, it's made of two things, living tree and dead tree. The innermost part of a tree is the oldest, deadest part, but the living part wraps around it and keeps building upon it. The dead parts are as much part of the General Sherman tree as the living parts. And because of that, you can't take the living part away from the dead part. You have to take the whole tree, the living part, the dead part, the yesterday part, the today part, the tomorrow part. You have to take it all. The living tree needs the dead tree to be alive. And that's what remembrance is about. We live grafted to the dead. They are the spine, the stem, the trunk around which our leaves blossom. The majesty of a tree is the majesty of life itself, of the union of a life that includes death. And part of what makes a great tree truly awesome 
a word that we cheapen by describing sports events, when it should be the word that means my knees are knocking and I am praying as hard as I can. Before such a tree, that is to be awesome. Charles Darwin came upon a similar insight and wrote about it in his great work. He writes, the affinities of all the beings of the same class have sometimes been represented as a great tree. I believe this simile largely speaks the truth. The green and budding twigs may represent existing species and those produced during former years may represent the long succession of extinct species. As buds give rise by growth to fresh buds, and these, if vigorous, branch out and overtop many a feebler branch, so by generation I believe it has been, the ta been with the great tree of life, which fills with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth and covers the surface with its ever-branching and beautiful ramifications. Are your knees knocking? Mine sure are. When we remember our ancestors, near and far, we sink ourselves back into the taproot of the tree of life. We remember that our life grows out of them, that their life is not entirely gone because it gives life to us. We sense the larger curves and contours of reality that we overlook in that myopia of thinking that we, the living, have some kind of dominion. We do not. Reverence is about remembering. Remembering those larger curves and contours of reality of a beautiful humility that provokes tenderness, not humiliation. That evokes smallness without feeling trivial that bids us remind ourselves of our limits without feeling the least bit ashamed. That's what trees do. They call us back to remember who we are. A line from a poet named Anna Akhmatova reads, many are the graceful hearts hung upon this tree, and it seems there's room for mine on these branches free. At our very best, we get to set our lives on a branch, somewhere on the tree of life, a leaf, a pine cone, a berry, perhaps. Wonderful as our momentary life is, and it is precious beyond measure, our lives are larger than that. We are to become the tree of life. She is a tree of life, and all who cling to her strength and be become part of the tree of life. Reach out. It's right there. Living, dying, and you will be amazed. It's Chaim He, the Makazikimba, she is a tree of life for all who hold her close. And so may it be. And so may it be. See you in church.